Section 21 of Reflections on the Revolution in France. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reflections on the Revolution in France and on the proceedings in certain societies in London relative to that event in a letter intended to have been sent to a gentleman in Paris, 1790, by Edmund Burke. Section 21 having concluded my few remarks on the constitution of the supreme power the executive the judicature the military and on the reciprocal relation of all these establishments i shall say something of the ability showed by your legislators with regard to the revenue in their proceedings relative to this object if possible still fewer traces appear of political judgment or financial resource when the states met it seemed to be the great object to improve the system of revenue to enlarge its collection to cleanse it of oppression and vexation and to establish it on the most solid footing great were the expectations entertained on that head throughout europe it was by this grand arrangement that france was to stand or fall and this became in my opinion very properly the test by which the skill and patriotism of those who ruled in that assembly would be tried the revenue of the state is the state in effect all depends upon it whether for support or for reformation the dignity of every occupation wholly depends upon the quantity and the kind of virtue that may be exerted in it as all great qualities of the mind which operate in public and are not merely suffering and passive require force for their display i had almost said for their unequivocal existence the revenue which is the spring of all power becomes in its administration the sphere of every active virtue public virtue being of a nature magnificent and splendid instituted for great things and conversant about great concerns requires abundant scope and room and cannot spread and grow under confinement and in circumstances straitened narrow and sordid through the revenue alone the body politic can act in its true genius and character and therefore it will display just as much of its collective virtue and as much of that virtue which may characterize those who move it and are as it were its life and guiding principle as it is possessed of a just revenue for from hence not only magnanimity and liberality and beneficence and fortitude and providence and the tutelary protection of all good arts derive their food and the growth of their organs but continence and self-denial and labor and vigilance and frugality and whatever else there is in which the mind shows itself above the appetite are nowhere more in their proper element than in the provision and distribution of the public wealth it is therefore not without reason that the science of speculative and practical finance which must take to its aid so many auxiliary branches of knowledge stands high in the estimation not only of the ordinary sort but of the wisest and best men and as this science has grown with the progress of its object the prosperity and improvement of nations has generally increased with the increase of their revenues and they will both continue to grow and flourish as long as the balance between what is left to strengthen the efforts of individuals and what is collected for the common efforts of the state bear to each other a due reciprocal proportion and are kept in a close correspondence and communication and perhaps it may be owing to the greatness of revenues and to the urgency of state necessities that old abuses in the constitution of finances are discovered and their true nature and rational theory comes to be more perfectly understood insomuch that a smaller revenue might have been more distressing in one period than a far greater is found to be in another the proportionate wealth even remaining the same in this state of things the french assembly found something in their revenues to preserve to secure and wisely to administer as well as to abrogate and alter though their proud assumption might justify the severest tests yet in trying their abilities on their financial proceedings i would only consider what is the plain obvious duty of a common finance minister and try them upon that and not upon models of ideal perfection the objects of a financier are then to secure an ample revenue to impose it with judgment and equality 
to employ it economically and when necessity obliges him to make use of credit to secure its foundations in that instance and forever by the clearness and candor of his proceedings the exactness of his calculations and the solidity of his funds on these heads we may take a short and distinct view of the merits and abilities of those in the national assembly who have taken to themselves the management of this arduous concern far from any increase of revenue in their hands i find by a report of m vanier from the committee of finances of the second of august last that the amount of the national revenue as compared with its produce before the revolution was diminished by the sum of two hundred millions or eight millions sterling of the annual income considerably more than one-third of the whole if this be the result of great ability never surely was ability displayed in a more distinguished manner or with so powerful an effect no common folly no vulgar incapacity no ordinary official negligence even no official crime no corruption no peculation hardly any direct hostility which we have seen in the modern world could in so short a time have made so complete an overthrow of the finances and with them of the strength of a great kingdom quedo quivestrum republicum tantum amicistis tam quito the sophisters and declaimers as soon as the assembly met began with decrying the ancient constitution of the revenue in many of its most essential branches such as the public monopoly of salt they charged it as truly as unwisely with being ill-contrived oppressive and partial this representation they were not satisfied to make use of in speeches preliminary to some plan of reform they declared it in a solemn resolution or public sentence as it were judicially passed upon it and this they dispersed throughout the nation at the time they passed the decree with the same gravity they ordered the same absurd oppressive and partial tax to be paid until they could find a revenue to replace it the consequence was inevitable the provinces which had always been exempted from this salt monopoly some of whom were charged with other contributions perhaps equivalent were totally disinclined to bear any part of the burden which by an equal distribution was to redeem the others as to the assembly occupied as it was with the declaration and violation of the rights of men and with their arrangements for general confusion it had neither leisure nor capacity to contrive nor authority to enforce any plan of any kind relative to the replacing the tax or equalizing it or compensating the provinces or for conducting their minds to any scheme of accommodation with the other districts which were to be relieved the people of the salt provinces impatient under taxes damned by the authority which had directed their payment very soon found their patience exhausted they thought themselves as skilful in demolishing as the assembly could be they relieved themselves by throwing off the whole burden animated by this example each district or part of a district judging of its own grievance by its own feeling and of its remedy by its own opinion did as it pleased with other taxes we are next to see how they have conducted themselves in contriving equal impositions proportioned to the means of the citizens and the least likely to lean heavy on the active capital employed in the generation of that private wealth from whence the public fortune must be derived by suffering the several districts and several of the individuals in each district to judge of what part of the old revenue they might withhold instead of better principles of equality a new inequality was introduced of the most oppressive kind payments were regulated by dispositions the parts of the kingdom which were the most submissive the most orderly or the most affectionate to the commonwealth bore the whole burden of the state nothing turns out to be so oppressive and unjust as a feeble government to fill up all the deficiencies in the old impositions and the new deficiencies of every kind which were to be expected what remained to a state without authority the national assembly called for a voluntary benevolence for a fourth part of the income of all the citizens to be estimated on the honor of those who were to pay they obtained something more than could be rationally calculated but what was far indeed from answerable to their real necessities and much less to their fond expectations 
rational people could have hoped for little from this their tax in the disguise of a benevolence tax weak ineffective and unequal a tax by which luxury avarice and selfishness were screened and the load thrown upon productive capital upon integrity generosity and public spirit a tax of regulation upon virtue at length the mask is thrown off and they are now trying means with little success of exacting their benevolence by force this benevolence the rickety offspring of weakness was to be supported by another resource the twin brother of the same prolific imbecility the patriotic donations were to make good the failure of the patriotic contribution john doe was to become security for richard roe by this scheme they took things of much price from the giver comparatively of small value to the receiver they ruined several trades they pillaged the crown of its ornaments the churches of their plate and the people of their personal decorations the invention of those juvenile pretenders to liberty was in reality nothing more than a servile imitation of one of the poorest resources of doting despotism they took an old huge full-bottomed periwig out of the wardrobe of the antiquated frippery of louis the fourteenth to cover the premature baldness of the national assembly they produced this old-fashioned formal folly though it had been so abundantly exposed in the memoirs of the duc de saint simon if to reasonable men it had wanted any arguments to display its mischief and insufficiency a device of the same kind was tried in my memory by louis the fifteenth but it answered at no time however the necessities of ruinous wars were some excuse for desperate projects the deliberations of calamity are rarely wise but here was a season for disposition and providence it was in a time of profound peace then enjoyed for five years and promising a much longer continuance that they had recourse to this desperate trifling they were sure to lose more reputation by sporting in their serious situation with these toys and playthings of finance which have filled half their journals than could possibly be compensated by the poor temporary supply which they afforded it seemed as if those who adopted such projects were wholly ignorant of their circumstances or wholly unequal to their necessities whatever virtue may be in these devices it is obvious that neither the patriotic gifts nor the patriotic contribution can ever be resorted to again the resources of public folly are soon exhausted the whole indeed of their scheme of revenue is to make by any artifice an appearance of a full reservoir for the hour whilst at the same time they cut off the springs and living fountains of perennial supply the account not long since furnished by m necker was meant without question to be favorable he gives a flattering view of the means of getting through the year but he expresses as it is natural he should some apprehension for that which is to succeed on this last prognostic instead of entering into the grounds of this apprehension in order by a proper foresight to prevent the prognosticated evil m necker receives a sort of friendly reprimand from the president of the assembly as to their other schemes of taxation it is impossible to say anything of them with certainty because they have not yet had their operation but nobody is so sanguine as to imagine they will fill up any perceptible part of the wide gaping breach which their incapacity has made in their revenues at present the state of their treasury sinks every day more and more in cash and swells more and more in fictitious representation when so little within or without is now found but paper the representative not of opulence but of want the creature not of credit but of power they imagine that our flourishing state in england is owing to that bank paper and not the bank paper to the flourishing condition of our commerce to the solidity of our credit and to the total exclusion of all idea of power from any part of the transaction they forget that in england not one shilling of paper money of any description is received but of choice that the whole has had its origin in cash actually deposited and that it is convertible at pleasure in an instant and without the smallest loss into cash again our paper is of value in commerce because in law it is of none it is powerful on change 
because in Westminster Hall it is impotent. In payment of a debt of twenty shillings, a creditor may refuse all the paper of the Bank of England, nor is there amongst us a single public security of any quality or nature whatsoever that is enforced by authority. In fact, it might be easily shown that our paper wealth, instead of lessening the real coin, has a tendency to increase it. Instead of being a substitute for money, it only facilitates its entry, its exit, and its circulation, that it is the symbol of prosperity, and not the badge of distress. Never was a scarcity of cash and an exuberance of paper a subject of complaint in this nation. Well, but a lessening of prodigal expenses, and the economy which has been introduced by the virtuous and sapient assembly, make amends for the losses sustained in the receipt of revenue. In this, at least, they have fulfilled the duty of a financier. Have those who say so looked at the expenses of the National Assembly itself, of the municipalities, of the city of Paris, of the increased pay of the two armies, of the new police, of the new judicatures? Have they even carefully compared the present pension list with the former? These politicians have been cruel, not economical. Comparing the expenses of the former prodigal government and its relation to the then revenues with the expenses of this new system, as opposed to the state of its new treasury, I believe the present will be found beyond all comparison more chargeable. Footnote. The reader will observe that I have but lightly touched, my plan demanded nothing more, on the condition of the French finances as connected with the demands upon them. If I had intended to do otherwise, the materials in my hands for such a task are not altogether perfect. On this subject, I refer the reader to M. de Calonne's work and the tremendous display that he has made of the havoc and devastation in the public estate and in all the affairs of France, caused by the presumptuous good intentions of ignorance and incapacity. Such effects those causes will always produce. Looking over that account with a pretty strict eye, and with perhaps too much rigor, deducting everything which may be placed to the account of a financier out of place, who might be supposed by his enemies desirous of making the most of his cause, I believe it will be found that a more salutary lesson of caution against the daring spirit of innovators than what has been supplied at the expense of France never was at any time furnished to mankind. End of footnote. It remains only to consider the proofs of financial ability furnished by the present French managers when they are to raise supplies on credit. Here I am a little at a stand, for credit, properly speaking, they have none. The credit of the ancient government was not, indeed, the best, but they could always, on some terms, command money, not only at home, but from most of the countries of Europe, where a surplus capital was accumulated and the credit of that government was improving daily. The establishment of a system of liberty would of course be supposed to give it new strength, and so it would actually have done if a system of liberty had been established. What offers has their government of pretended liberty had from Holland, from Hamburg, from Switzerland, from Genoa, from England, for a dealing in their paper? Why should these nations of commerce and economy enter into any pecuniary dealings with a people who attempt to reverse the very nature of things, amongst whom they see the debtor prescribing at the point of the bayonet the medium of his solvency to the creditor, discharging one of his engagements with another, turning his very penury into his resource, and paying his interest with his rags? Their fanatical confidence in the omnipotence of church plunder has induced these philosophers to overlook all care of the public estate, just as the dream of the philosopher's stone induces dupes, under the more plausible delusion of the hermetic art, to neglect all rational means of improving their fortunes. With these philosophic financiers, this universal medicine made of church mummy is to cure all the evils of the state. These gentlemen, perhaps, do not believe a great deal in the miracles of piety, but it cannot be questioned that they have an undoubting faith in the prodigies of sacrilege. Is there a debt which presses them? Issue assignats. Are compensations to be made or a maintenance decreed to those whom they have robbed of their freehold in their office or expelled from their profession? Assignats. 
Is a fleet to be fitted out? Assignats. If sixteen million sterling of these assignats forced on the people leave the wants of the state as urgent as ever, issue, says one, thirty million sterling of assignats. Says another, issue fourscore millions more of assignats. The only difference among their financial factions is on the greater or the lesser quantity of assignats to be imposed on the public sufferance. They are all professors of assignats. Even those whose natural good sense and knowledge of commerce, not obliterated by philosophy, furnish decisive arguments against this delusion, conclude their arguments by proposing the omission of assignats. I suppose they must talk of assignats as no other language would be understood. All experience of their inefficacy does not in the least discourage them. Are the old assignats depreciated at market? What is the remedy? Issue new assignats. Ma i si malatia opiniatria non vult segarire, quid illi facere? Assignare, postea assignare, ensuita assignare. The word is a trifle altered. The Latin of your present doctors may be better than that of your old comedy. Their wisdom and the variety of their resources are the same. They have not more notes in their song than the cuckoo. Though far from the softness of that harbinger of summer and plenty, their voice is as harsh and as ominous as that of the raven. Who but the most desperate adventurers in philosophy and finance could at all have thought of destroying the settled revenue of the state, the sole security for the public credit, in the hope of rebuilding it with the materials of confiscated property. If, however, an excessive zeal for the state should have led a pious and venerable prelate, by anticipation a father of the church, to pillage his own order, footnote, la bruyere of Bossuet, and a footnote, and for the good of the church and people, to take upon himself the place of grand financier of confiscation and comptroller general of sacrilege, he and his coadjutors were, in my opinion, bound to show, by their subsequent conduct, that they knew something of the office they assumed. When they had resolved to appropriate to the fisc a certain portion of the landed property of their conquered country, it was their business to render their bank a real fund of credit, as far as such a bank was capable of becoming so. To establish a current circulating credit upon any land bank, under any circumstances whatsoever, has hitherto proved difficult at the very least. The attempt has commonly ended in bankruptcy, but when the assembly were led through a contempt of moral to a defiance of economical principles, it might at least have been expected that nothing would be omitted on their part to lessen this difficulty, to prevent any aggravation of this bankruptcy. It might be expected that, to render your land bank tolerable, every means would be adopted that could display openness and candor in the statement of the security, everything which could aid the recovery of the demand. To take things in their most favorable point of view, your condition was that of a man of a large landed estate which he wished to dispose of for the discharge of a debt and the supply of certain services. Not being able instantly to sell, you wished to mortgage. What would a man of fair intentions and a commonly clear understanding do in such circumstances? Ought he not first to ascertain the gross value of the estate, the charges of its management and disposition, the encumbrances perpetual and temporary of all kinds that affect it? Then, striking a net surplus, to calculate the just value of the security? When that surplus, the only security to the creditor, had been clearly ascertained and properly vested in the hands of trustees, then he would indicate the parcels to be sold, and the time and conditions of sale. After this he would admit the public creditor, if he chose it, to subscribe his stock into this new fund. Or he might receive proposals for an assignat from those who would advance money to purchase this species of security. This would be to proceed like men of business, methodically and rationally and on the only principles of public and private credit that have an existence. The dealer would then know exactly what he purchased, and the only doubt which could hang upon his mind would be the dread of the resumption of the spoil, which one day might be made, perhaps with an addition of punishment, from the sacrilegious gripe of those execrable wretches who could become purchasers at the auction of their innocent fellow-citizens. 
an open and exact statement of the clear value of the property and of the time the circumstances and the place of sale were all necessary to efface as much as possible the stigma that has hitherto been branded on every kind of land bank it became necessary on another principle that is on account of a pledge of faith previously given on that subject that their future fidelity in a slippery concern might be established by their adherence to their first engagement when they had finally determined on a state resource from church booty they came on the fourteenth of april seventeen ninety to a solemn resolution on the subject and pledged themselves to their country that in the statement of the public charges for each year there should be brought to account a sum sufficient for defraying the expenses of the roman catholic religion the support of the ministers at the altars the relief of the poor the pensions to the ecclesiastics secular as well as regular of the one and of the other sects in order that the estates and goods which are at the disposal of the nation may be disengaged of all charges and employed by the representatives or the legislative body to the great and most pressing exigencies of the state they further engaged on the same day that the sum necessary for the year seventeen ninety one should be forthwith determined in this resolution they admitted their duty to show distinctly the expense of the above objects which by other resolutions they had before engaged should be first in the order of provision they admit that they ought to show the estate clear and disengaged of all charges and that they should show it immediately have they done this immediately or at any time have they ever furnished a rent roll of the immovable estate or given in an inventory of the movable effects which they confiscate to their assignats in what manner they can fulfil their engagements of holding out to public service an estate disengaged of all charges without authenticating the value of the estate or the quantum of the charges i leave it to their english admirers to explain instantly upon this assurance and previously to any one step towards making it good they issue on the credit of so handsome a declaration sixteen millions sterling of their paper this was manly who after this masterly stroke can doubt of their abilities in finance but then before any other emission of these financial indulgences they took care at least to make good their original promise if such estimate either of the value of the estate or the amount of the encumbrances has been made it has escaped me i never heard of it at length they have spoken out and they have made a full discovery of their abominable fraud in holding out the church lands as a security for any debts or any service whatsoever they rob only to enable them to cheat but in a very short time they defeat the ends both of the robbery and the fraud by making out accounts for other purposes which blow up their whole apparatus of force and of deception i am obliged to m de calonne for his reference to the document which proves this extraordinary fact it had by some means escaped me indeed it was not necessary to make out my assertion as to the breach of faith on the declaration of the fourteenth of april seventeen ninety by a report of their committee it now appears that the charge of keeping up the reduced ecclesiastical establishments and other expenses attendant on religion and maintaining the religious of both sexes retained or pensioned and the other concomitant expenses of the same nature which they have brought upon themselves by this convulsion in property exceeds the income of the estates acquired by it in the enormous sum of two millions sterling annually besides a debt of seven millions and upwards these are the calculating powers of imposture this is the finance of philosophy this is the result of all the delusions held out to engage a miserable people in rebellion murder and sacrilege and to make them prompt and zealous instruments in the ruin of their country never did a state in any case enrich itself by the confiscations of the citizens this new experiment has succeeded like all the rest every honest mind every true lover of liberty and humanity must rejoice to find that injustice is not always good policy nor rapine the high road to riches i subjoin with pleasure in a note the able and spirited observations of m de calonne on this subject footnote ce n'est point à l'assemblée entière que je m'adresse ici 
je ne parle qu'à ceux qui l'égarent, en lui cachant sous des gazes séduisantes le but où il l'entraîne. C'est à eux que je dis, votre objet, vous n'en disconviendrez pas, c'est d'ôter tout espoir au clergé et de consommer sa ruine. C'est là, en ne vous soupçonnant d'aucune combinaison de cupidité, d'aucun regard sur le jeu des effets publics, c'est là ce qu'on doit croire que vous avez en vue dans la terrible opération que vous proposez. C'est ce qui doit en être le fruit. Mais le peuple que vous y intéressez, quel avantage peut-il y trouver En vous servant sans cesse de lui, que faites-vous pour lui Rien, absolument rien. Et au contraire, vous faites ce qui ne conduit qu'à l'accabler de nouvelles charges. Vous avez rejeté, à son préjudice, une offre de quatre cents millions dont l'acceptation pouvait devenir un moyen de soulagement en sa faveur. Et à cette ressource, aussi profitable que légitime, vous avez substitué une injustice ruineuse qui, de votre propre aveu, charge le trésor public et par conséquent le peuple d'un surcroît de dépenses annuelles de cinquante millions au moins et d'un remboursement de cent cinquante millions. Malheureux peuple voilà ce que vous vaut en dernier résultat l'expropriation de l'Église et la dureté des décrets taxateurs du traitement des ministres d'une religion bienfaisante. Et désormais, ils seront à votre charge. Leur charité soulageait les pauvres, et vous allez être imposé pour subvenir à leur entretien. De l'État de la France End of footnote. End of section 21.